Hi guys, this is Creative Cuts, the channel where I build, paint and create things. After a huge number of requests, I've put together a small guide on how to get into the world of airbrushing for the complete beginner, and how it can be a great tool in your arsenal when miniature building or making dioramas. Now before we begin, I'm no expert, but I've been airbrushing for approximately 20 years, making everything from custom signs, t-shirts, to a few motorbikes for friends, as well as incorporating it into my own artwork. So I've made plenty of mistakes along the way and try to learn from them. Now, first off, to begin, airbrushing isn't cheap. You need a bit of kit to get started and once all this adds up, you can easily be looking at a couple of hundred pounds. Quite an investment if you're only gonna use it once or twice or unsure about it. But if you have decided to make that plunge, then here is what you will need. A compressor or an alternative source of air. This is my little compressor and it's the second one I bought. And it's lasted me a good 15 years and still going strong. They don't need to be super fancy, but you basically get what you pay for, as you will find that this will be the theme for most of this video. Any decent compressor from any reputable manufacturer will do the job. The air comes out of this little fitting onto which we connect a hose. Now these come in all shapes and sizes, but for now I'll show you this little rubber one as this is what you will find in most starter sets. These are cheap and prone to leaks as they're not very durable, but the hose screws onto the compressor and then you connect the other end to either directly to the airbrush or advisably to a pressure gauge. This one came with my compressor and has a built-in moisture trap. Air has naturally got water in it, so this removes any moisture content from your hose before giving the airbrush pure air, so to speak. This gauge allows me to adjust the pressure of the air coming into my airbrush. This is important because you will find that different types of airbrushing will require different pressures to operate in an optimal way. You can lower the pressure for really fine detail work, but Usually I will have my pressure set somewhere between 20 and 40 psi. The whole lot drops into this little clamp hanger, which also has two useful spaces to rest your airbrush when not in use. This has another connection onto which we attach another hose for the airbrush. Now this type of hose is the type that I use and can highly recommend. These are what are called braided hoses. Much thicker and more, far more durable, and they have a good weight to them so they hang directly down out of the way. I also found that uh, a little quick release connection is one of the small quality of life tips that can make one's life just 1000% easier. I have multiple airbrushes connected to my compressor, so I use a splitter connection to give me some extra hose connection points. A little PTFE tape can help seal these connections. And now onto the actual airbrushes. There are several different types and these can really vary in price. The first type is a single action airbrush, which is basically a small spray can which you can change the color of. You press the trigger and paint and air come out together. These are generally cheap and I wouldn't recommend these. To get the full experience and overall effect of what can be achieved with an airbrush, you will really need to use a dual action airbrush. This means that the trigger will blow air when pressed down and then you can pull back on the trigger which in turn will pull back a needle inside the airbrush which lets you to control the amount of paint released into the air. This type of airbrush is called a siphon feed airbrush as it has a large color capacity making it great for larger projects and general purpose spraying. This one here is an Iowata Revolution. You can change color really quickly by attaching a water cup and spraying out any leftover color inside the airbrush and then just swapping it out for the next. You can buy bottle attachments, which can be attached directly onto the bottles of paint or special pre-made mixes that you've made. But the most common type of airbrush and the type I would recommend to beginners is a, a gravity feed airbrush. As I said, these have a needle inside which goes back and forth to regulate the amount of paint which comes out. This one here is an Iwata Highline Plus. And something that you will quickly find out and have to become familiar with is that you will need to take your airbrush apart a lot for cleaning, for troubleshooting and for any other number of reasons. This has become something of a ritual and 
something I could probably do with my eyes closed. <laughs> similar to a soldier stripping their rifle, for example. And in order to do this, give yourself a clean workspace and begin to remove the needle. To start, remove the rear housing, followed by the small locking nut at the back. This allows you to gently pull out the needle. This needle is the key to clean and even spraying. The tips are extremely fragile and can easily be bent or damaged if mishandled. I've certainly bent my fair share of needles, so having a couple of spare ones is always a good idea. Next, you can remove the two front parts of the nozzle to reveal the tip of your airbrush. This part is also pretty fragile, so take care not to drop it directly onto this part. This can also be removed with a little spanner in the case of an Iwata airbrush, but I have found that unless you need to replace this part, I never really need to remove it for cleaning. And to put it all back together, you follow the same process again, but in reverse. Starting with the front of the airbrush and then carefully threading the needle through the body again until you feel it stop inside the nozzle. Then tighten the locking nut and you're good to go. I just wanted to also show you my Frankenstein airbrush, which shows you how the principles can stay the same, but each company will do things a little differently. This airbrush started out as a Hansa airbrush, but I've since changed out some of the parts with Iwata parts, as they just happen to fit. The main difference is that the nozzle here is separate. At first, things can seem a little confusing as each company has their own little features, so to speak, but the overall mechanics generally stay the same. And I've found an airbrush holder to be extremely useful, and I have several on hand to make my life easier. Next on to paint. You can pretty much spray any paint through an airbrush as long as it's thin enough, but I can definitely recommend some specific paints which I use a lot. Firstly, dedicated miniature paints, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with already. In this case, these are made by Vallejo, and you can pretty much use these straight from the bottle. Major artist paint companies will often also do their range of pre-thinned airbrush paint. In this case, Golden do a great range of liquid acrylics. These also come in opaque and transparent versions to give you different effects. Next is some specific multi-purpose water-based airbrush paint. In this case, Createx. This is probably my favorite type of paint with the Wicked Colors range being the latest version of these paints. For anyone really interested in this, there are some really great demos you can search on YouTube using Wicked Paints and you can see what they're really capable of. To thin and clean my airbrushes, I use thinner or reducer as it's sometimes called. You can find all manner of additives from transparent bases to airbrush medium and flow improver. Inks are also great to spray through an airbrush as they're naturally thin and highly pigmented. How thin you want your paint is a little bit of a guessing game and sometimes down to personal preference, but as a common rule of thumb, you're kind of after the consistency of, of milk. This may vary from company to company, but with a bit of experimentation, you will soon find a ratio that seems to work for you. Some people mix their paint directly in the cup of the airbrush, but I prefer to mix it in these little shot glasses so my paint is consistent throughout. So, okay, you've got a load of equipment, but the big question is what do you do with it? There are many different types of mark you can make with an airbrush, how close you hold the airbrush to the surface, how far you pull back the trigger, how fast you physically move, will all have different effects on the type of mark that you make. You can use stencils and loose marks to really define different shapes. Here are a couple of quick doodles I did for practice using just one or two colors. So now you've done your spraying and now you need to clean it. And this is the part that people are most afraid of, but the process can be really easy. Firstly, I recommend that you do this at a table or desk and not over the sink or basin as small parts can easily disappear down the plug hole. <laughs> Take a small container filled with warm water, add a little thinner and begin to strip down your airbrush as I demonstrated earlier. Give all the parts a good soak, then with a few paper towels and some cotton buds dipped in a little thinner, I just clean out any remaining paint.
and carefully reassemble. These airbrushes are both over 10 years old and used nearly every day. Sure, I've had to replace the odd part here and there, but when cleaned up, they look almost brand new. A supplier of spares is also really useful, and I've added a couple of links in the description to places where I get mine, albeit these are in the UK, but again, a good place to start if you don't know where to begin. Great, well that's all well and good, but how does any of that apply to miniatures and dioramas? And at first I imagine it seems pretty complicated, so here I've included a few practical examples from previous videos I've made in order to show how the skill level you actually need for miniatures isn't high at all. Here I use an airbrush basically as a substitute for a spray can to colour some trees in a Star Wars diorama I made link above if you want to watch it in full. It's literally just applying colour. I could do this with a conventional brush, but it's much faster with an airbrush. Level of skill required? 1 out of 10. Next in this example, I get a little more technical by blending some colours together to create the effect of an explosion. basically spraying random dots on the cotton wool, getting darker towards the edges. Level of skill required, three out of 10. Here I'm darkening what will be my riverbed in my floating ancient ruins diorama. Again, a link above if you wanna watch it in full. Simply spraying a mix of brown and black into deeper parts to give a deeper tone. Very simple, skill level, two out of 10. In this example, I use the airbrush to simulate light and do this by spraying a stronger white line and then just hazing off the edges. And then going over this with a transparent blue. The effect works really well, but the lines that I'm actually making are relatively simple and only require basic control of, of an airbrush and a, just a little lightness of touch. Overall skill level, four out of 10. And on this jungle diorama, I used an airbrush to deepen some of the shadow areas and paint what would be difficult to reach with a brush. Again, overall skill level, three out of 10. And finally, another example, that with some basic graduating lines, you can achieve really effective coloring and blending on your models. Overall difficulty, maybe a five out of 10. Spraying a three-dimensional shape is far more forgiving than spraying a flat surface. So one good tip is to build up your airbrush control with exercises on paper. Try drawing a picture, following a few YouTube tutorials, or writing your name a bunch of times. This will massively improve your overall confidence and ability when working on your prized creations. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. An airbrush is like any other tool. It will not magically make things look amazing like any tool. You need to learn its strengths and its weaknesses, learn how to use it, and it will become almost an extension of your hand. Take care of it, and it will repay you with hours of frustration but when the pieces of the puzzle start falling into place, it can be so much fun. Thank you for watching. There are so many aspects to airbrushing to cover in one video, but hopefully this small introduction helps to begin to build a picture of what is possible, what is involved, and most of all, how fun it can be. See you in the next one. It sound right, boy.